So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 2nd, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 186. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here. You probably want to know, hey Fred, what's it doing outside? Well, it's 37 degrees Fahrenheit right now, and that is minus 3 Celsius. 61% relative humidity. By the way, for those of you that are wondering, my little hot pockets made out of double bubble that I put around my observation hives inside an unheated building. Uh, I have a heat sensor sitting on top of the observation hive. So underneath the double bubble, on top of the hive itself. So it's just got that little envelope over it. Consistently 10 degrees warmer just because of stuff like that around it. It's a great experiment, lots of fun this year. And I have a sensor there and I have something I can check on my phone and just look to see what's going on inside that building without even having, you know, to walk the, you know, 80 feet to get there. So if you're brand new, I'm glad that you're here. You're in for a treat because we're gonna sit around and talk about bees. Also, maybe you wanna know what we're gonna talk about. So you should look down in the video description below and all the topics will be listed in order with some related links for further information if you want to know more. And if you want to know where do these questions come from, people submit them over the previous week. Some as recent as this morning, by the way. So how do you submit your own question? You could write it down in the comment section of any of my YouTube videos. There's over 900 of them. I know, it's a lot to get through. You can also go to my website called thewaytobe.org and there's a page there called The Way to Be as well. And you can click on that page, click on the form and fill it out and you can remain anonymous or put in any information, nickname, whatever you want. If the question has not been answered a lot before and I think will be of broad interest to my viewers, we might uh, be able to talk about that in an upcoming Q&A. I always mean to do more videos in between these and I always run out of time. So the only video I made in addition to a regular Q&A video last week was one about my backyard weather station, which by the way, I'm really enjoying. And the weather information that you get from the website, Ambient Weather is the name of the website. Um, that information is more accurate than my local, you know, weather forecasters, the meteorologists, because they are a good 700 feet lower than I am related to sea level. So just for example, today they said it was going to be 51 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but it's not. My weather station said, and the forecast through ambient weather, which is a network of a whole bunch of other backyard uh, weather stations, it said it would hit 42. They were right because we're headed that way. Even though I wrote down 37 here, it's rising slow and steady. The chickens are out. My chickens have thermal locks on their coop doors. So unless it goes above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is zero Celsius, those doors don't even open. They're coop tender uh, doors. So they're completely controlled again by your phone. This is the amazing modern age. So anyway, that's where the questions come from. People submitted them. Like the first question we're gonna talk about today, which comes from James. He says, I have a question about full deep frames of pollen slant bee bread. I heard the bees ferment the pollen into bee bread. How long does this last for? I've had colonies that have three of these frames out of 10. So I've removed some here and there to reduce congestion and add comb and for the queen to lay in. I have used these frames in splits before but I have uh, seemed to make a collection of these bee bread frames that I keep in my barn fridge. Not sure how long they last and if bees will ever use them again since they are not fresh anymore. Also, they have a distinct smell. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it doesn't smell good like honey frames. Well, that smell, by the way, is uh, why they call it bee bread. It's fermenting. And if you've ever had observation hives or building, as I do with observation hives, multiples in it, I'm going to add more. You know when the pollen's coming in and when they're making bee bread because it's fermenting and it does smell. It smells like something's fermenting in there. And it's not a terrible smell. It's a distinctive pollen processing smell for your bees. So there's a lot going on there. And I also want to give a shout out to the Bee Informed Partnership. I highly recommend that you check them out and be informed 
and uh, you can Google that. And they collect information and data and provide all kinds of best practices and things like that for beekeepers all over the place. So if you've never checked them out, check them out. The reason I bring them up right now is they just had a live webinar where they talked to a bunch of experts, a bunch of researchers. And guess what the topic was? Well, part of it was um, what's going on with pollen because they talked about toxicity and uh, neonicotinoids and things like that. What's going on in agriculture, uh, the pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, all the things that are being spread around near bee yards, and even where neonics are being manufactured and then applied to seed, so it protects the seed when it goes in the ground. So the thing was, they looked at honey, they looked at beeswax, and they looked at pollen. Which of those three things do you think demonstrated the highest pesticide load? pollen because it makes sense you know because the uh, foraging bees house bees are the ones that are making the bees wax and of course they're consuming carbohydrates to do that that's why people get concerned when we're thinking about getting rid of frames of drawn comb because it does take a lot of uh, sugar syrup for example or honey depending on what you have in your hive and it takes a lot of it for them to manufacture beeswax through their little wax glands and uh, workers do that. So there is some residue in the beeswax as well. And that accumulates over the years because every bee that tracks through the hive walks on the beeswax and the pollen uh, that carries these diseases. Why did I say disease? The pollen that carries, it could carry disease, but the pollen that carries uh, these treatments, these ag chemicals, uh, gets concentrated in your beeswax because your beeswax is there for years. But as far as the pollen load, immediate load, the pollen itself, which is coming from these plants that have been treated, has the highest concentration. And the lowest concentration is found in honey. And they've not yet found examples, and they're doing a lot of testing, uh, of honey that was contaminated to a point where the FDA would be concerned about it. So, whew, on that. But it was a really good webinar. Shout out to... Um, the Be Informed Partnership. It was very good that they hosted that. But it tied in with this because the first question I have to ask is, why do you want to get rid of this pollen and why are you pulling it out? It's very valuable to the bees. So here we are in December now, the second day of December. And uh, any pollen that would be in the hives right now, I highly recommend leaving there for those of you who are listening in the Northern Hemisphere. And so I realized that some people are in the South. Uh, it is true that sometimes bees will store pollen in a cell inside their hives and not use it. And I'm not sure what their ability is to detect uh, the pollen, whether it's good, bad, spoiled, too old. So the other question is, when do they use it most often? I can answer that from direct observation. Uh, one of the cool things about observation hives is when bees come in, you get to watch them store pollen if it's on the outward facing frame. So those directly under the glass so you can look at them. And I do have a video that shows all of that activity. Foraging bees collect the pollen from these plants. And uh, of course they start working on it right away. If you've ever watched honeybees when they're collecting pollen from a pollen source, uh, they'll often land on the plant. And they do this a lot with sunflowers. It's really interesting. They seem to land on the sunflower, they're clambering around, of course they're getting nectar, and we know they're doing that because their tongues are extended. And then the pollen is all over their body, and sometimes the bee will back off of that flower and they'll hover for a second, and then you'll see their forelimbs go, and then you'll see them raking the pollen back. But one of the things that they're also doing, if you can catch it, because it happens lightning fast, they put out a little bit of nectar, and that makes the pollen sticky. So they're already beginning to process pollen right then because they've already amended it with something so then that makes it sticky that's also why sometimes pollen that's coming in uh, is much darker than the pollen that we see on the anthers of the plants that the bees visit because they're already amending that sometimes with honey that they've collected from the hive before they even flew out other times they're using nectar that has been freshly gathered and it's in their nectar crop and they regurgitate that and use it to stick the pollen together so that's kind of cool too, but in my observations, in the observation hive, when they bring in the pollen, and what it is is the foraging bees come in with the pollen, they scratch it off their hind legs, and they put it right in the cell themselves. 
So where that's different uh, from the way they manage nectar, for example, because when a forager comes in and they've got nectar to unload, a housekeeper bee accepts that nectar and then they run it up and put it in the cells for honey stores. So that's different processing. And so these field bees is another reason why there's probably concentrations of uh, material that they find out in the environment more concentrated in the pollen cells than in the nectar and honey cells because the bees that are actually doing the foraging, they're in direct contact with the plants or often getting sprayed directly, heaven forbid, uh, by the farmers that are spreading their chemicals to protect their crops. Uh, that all gets concentrated in the pollen store cells. 48 hours, roughly, is when you see the strongest fermentation. And, by the way, I don't know if it's really the strongest fermentation, but it's definitely the pollen that the nurse bees are going after to attend to the brood. That makes it critical. And for those of you who don't know, the pollen is used to rear brood. That's the whole point of it. Who's consuming pollen? Any adult bees inside the hive? The worker bees are. The nurse bees that are attending brood are consuming pollen. So what happens is the fermentation process begins and it makes the pollen more palatable, more digestible, more usable for the nurse bees that are gonna consume it. Guess who else has pollen that shows up in her digestive system? The queen, because she is fed exclusively by nurse bees. So she has a retinue. So the queen also gets fed. Um, so here's the thing. Now let's say we bypass that time. If no new pollen is coming in, then they consume stored pollen and they start going after even the older stuff. If there's a constant influx of pollen coming into your hive and going to the brood area, and usually pollen is stored around where the eggs are being laid and brood is being developed, and some are pupa, so they're capped, and so you'll see a ring of pollen around that, and then sometimes you'll see a whole face frame, solid pollen, which to me, when I look at that, I'm like, yes, it looks great. Plus I look for a diversity in the color of the pollen because then I know that they're getting a lot of different resources because the last thing I want my bees to do is bring in pollen from just one single resource as a colony. Individual pollen foraging bees are floral constant. So there's evidence that even through the foraging life of this bee, for example, once it starts on dandelions with each of its foraging flights, that bee and her mates that fly out with her, they often do foraging groups. Uh, they'll stay on dandelions and they come back. And then when the dandelion, um, kind of when that season of dandelions passes, there's some evidence that a lot of those bees go on to do other jobs other than pollen and nectar collection. So they may graduate to becoming just water bees, for example. So they don't necessarily, ah, oh, darn, now the dandelions are gone by and now we'll go after clover because our other bees are also going after clover at the time that some of the foragers are on dandelions. So they're floral constant, they're exclusive to those. I'm not saying that they don't later change jobs, but there's some evidence that a lot of them, once that particular plant is no longer available, they stop foraging on plants for pollen and nectar, that little group. So they have new replacements coming out all the time that are looking for new things to forage on. So that's interesting stuff. But there are cases, because look what bees do sometimes. For the smartest insects, which bees are, honeybees uh, often just go after texture that seems like pollen. They're not always good at picking out good things. Sometimes you can find them in your chicken feed bins. If you've got crumbles and, or if you've got uh, chicken feed that's all ground up in the feed bins, like in the troughs where the chickens feed, you'll see a little powdery bit. So it's probably corn and stuff like that. And you'll once in a while see honeybees in there rolling in it like it's a flower. And then they're collecting pollen balls on their corbicula, uh, which really all it is is um, corn. So Worse than that, you can see them sometimes on uh, sawdust bins. So if you've got a wood shop, which a lot of beekeepers do, and if you do a lot of sanding, like I have a bucket that I just collect sanding dust in. And that's because that dust is really fine. I can later mix it with, um, you know, wood glue and make a filler out of it. So I have that handy. But if a honeybee gets in there, they don't know nutrition. I don't know what's wrong with these bees. They get the pollen together. It's not pollen now, it's sawdust. They make little corbicula balls on their hind legs and 
off they go. And of course, they've added their own nectar to it, which makes it kind of palatable because there's a lot going on with pollen. And But once it's inside and they do their waggle dance, and they're trying to brag about what they found, they kind of get rejected. But still, who puts the pollen in the cell? The foraging bee. So it's not like a storekeeper bee can reject as they do often with nectar. If there's some nectar coming in they don't like, they just don't take it. And then the ones that can't unload their nectar, you see those workers around on the brood frames trembling. So they just tremble in the garbage and they're trembling. It looks like a waggle dance. The only difference is they're going all over the hive and they are waiting and trying to encourage bees to take the nectar that they're carrying. But if it's an undesirable nectar, the storekeeper bees can ignore them. Not only that, if a storekeeper bee doesn't like what that bee's coming in while they're doing a wagging dance, they can get beeped. Yeah, they get rammed in the side by a worker bee that goes eh, and they do it over and over until that bee stops waggling because they don't want any more of whatever it is they're selling. So this is very complex and I realize I've gone the long way around the barn on that, but I wanted you to kind of understand all the stuff that's going on and there's much more still to learn and observe. But so when the cells get full and then they even put like a capping on it. So the nurse bees get in there and they work the pollen even more and they start smashing it with their heads and they keep amending it and they chew it a little bit. And so they're adding their own enzymes and everything to it. And then you'll see that the pollen actually gets kind of a little honey cap, borderline wax cap. And that's when they're finished with that cell. They don't add any more. So if you could see a cross section of the cell, you would see the layers of pollen that get packed in there. And I do have a video that shows that very thing because they built their cells right up against the glass so we could see that activity. And then when it gets old and it's sealed up and if they don't use it and there's new pollen coming in, they ignore the old stuff. And eventually there is old pollen inside hives. It gets uh, kind of entombed, embalmed, and uh, it gets ignored. So eventually, at some point, you might have to get rid of it. But only three face frames of pollen. It takes, in general, a full frame of pollen to produce a full frame of brood. So it can actually be consumed pretty darn fast. So this time of year, I leave it in there, no matter what it looks like, no matter how old it seems to be, although we know it's probably this year. And then uh, in spring, if it's still there, that's when I take it out and get rid of it. So uh, storing it and freezing it, uh, I don't know, saving that old pollen. I think you're going to be stuck with pollen in those frames because it's usually in brood frames, by the way. Those cells are pretty tough. And uh, I don't think I would freeze old pollen. So if I had extracted honey, let's say, and there's a good percentage of that frame that had pollen on it, which generally doesn't happen because it's usually in the brood area and I don't extract brood frames. But uh, if that's in there, I would, at the end of extraction, I would get that out of there. And there are a lot of ways to do it. Of course, usually if that's at the end of the year and temperatures are getting cold, your options might be limited, but we want to make sure that uh, we're preserving frames so that we don't have, you know, wax moth larvae and things like that in them. And we want to make sure that we put them in storage, but uh, I wouldn't personally store pollen frames because that's not fresh even though it sounds like you're doing good stuff, putting it in the freezer and everything. I would take it out, and there's a couple of ways that you can do it. When we get these really hot days, by the way, when the sun's shining, and this may not be something that you can do in your own backyard, but I have 150 feet and a 200 foot garden hose. And I pay out the garden hose across the yard in the sun. And then I let that heat up until about two in the afternoon and the garden hose water gets really hot. And when you have a lot of it, a lot of hose, then uh, the water coming out comes out hot, just like a shower. So then you have an opportunity to wash off your bee frames and with hot water. And so you can rinse it off, but remember that some of those uh, seem to be capped, like almost like they were protecting the nurse bees from using it. Like they decided, ah, this isn't good. We're just gonna put a lid on it instead of scooping it out and hauling it out the front. They just kind of seal it up. So you're going to have to take something, you know, you can use kebab sticks or whatever you want to, but you need to poke 
the sealed frames are brewed, so you poke holes in them because obviously if it's got a wax capping on it, then it's not gonna be easily rinsed out. So poking those holes, very easy to do quickly, poke holes in all the ones. And then you can rinse them out with hot water. Now let's say that that didn't work and it didn't get them all out. Uh, because also what's happening at the end of the year, you uh, have bees that are looking for last minute forage. And for me, I have a robbing station and I like to put bee frames out that have been extracted so the other bees can clean it up. But what if there's pollen in there? Will they clean out the pollen? Uh, some of the wasps and stuff do. This is one time of year where the yellow jacket wasps, for example, are handy to me. So you can actually spray the frames, spray the comb with uh, one to one sugar syrup. And that will encourage them to get right in there. Same thing, if you've poked the holes in that stuff, you'll get them to excavate that because the wasps are trying to get every little bit out of every single cell. And sure, they do some cell damage. They chew the tops off, they chew the edges. That's how desperate they are for any kind of sugar that they can find. So we get them to work for us by wetting your pollen that's in there with one one sugar syrup, and now the wasps will do that cleanup for you. Honeybees too. But the honeybees do less of a good job cleaning up pollen. The, the others, the wasps, will do it. And also bumblebees come in there and they do a lot of ripping things open. So then you'll have workable frames and then you can rinse them off again, put them in storage after that. So those are just some ideas of what to do. But unless that pollen is really old, I would leave it for the bees because you never know when you're going to hit a dearth. Because guess what else happens when it's raining, for example, and we get a week of rain and you've got a couple of frames of pollen in there, they can actually go through quite a lot of that in a very short amount of time. So if it's from that season, I wouldn't pull it out. Uh, they need it. They need a lot of pollen. It needs to be good. So there's that. Question number two comes from Michael, Mercer, Wisconsin. Are you aware or have you ever heard of a flower or pollen source that would cause honeybees to return with the top back of their thorax and abdomen covered in pollen as if wearing pollen backpacks? I first thought someone had painted my bees, Tom Seeley style, but I realized after videoing it, this appears to be pollen. This was yellow, jack, yellow pollen on September 20th in hardiness zone 4A, and I'd seen it for a few days before thinking to video. So the worker shows up at around 22 seconds. All right, so there's a description about this YouTube, but I didn't, I didn't look at the YouTube video because this question comes every single year. And what it looks like, and I'm gonna put up slides for you, of pictures that I've taken of the plant that causes that, because this does come up so often, I went out with my macro gear and I photographed it. So we're talking about spotted jewel weed, and uh, it's also called touch me knots, has the nickname snap weed because of the, the pods that you can push down with your finger and let go and the, the little seeds pop out, which is a lot of fun when you have grandkids because it makes it look like you know all these secrets about nature. And if you have troubles finding information, you can also look up impatience. Now, I know a lot of people mispronounce that and say impatience. So it's impatience, I-M-P-A-T-I-E-N-S. So jewelweed, spotted jewelweed. Now, another photo that I'm going to put up is called self-heal. So I want to show self-heal first. So when we look at this plant, it is unique in its design, but I want you to see that the bees do go after self-heal and I have it as a ground cover everywhere. The reason it doesn't leave marks on the thorax of the bee is because it's so tiny that only their proboscis gets in there. They don't stick their whole head in, they don't stick their whole body in. So now let's pull up the next couple of pictures and this is spotted jewelweed. So when you look at jewelweed, it's larger. It's about the size of the end of your pinky. And uh, it also, if you look at where the anthers located, they're right on top of the interior surface of the jewelry, jewelweed blossom. So when the honeybee goes in to get the nectar, they have no choice but to get painted right across their thorax. In some cases, as described in this question, it also goes onto their abdomen. And the pollen is very concentrated, it's very dense, and it's very fine. And the honeybees don't do a very good job of being able to scratch their own back, so to speak. So what they end up doing is, that's why you get this hourglass shape on their back often. 
And that's because when they rake across their back with their legs, they can only reach so far. And then of course, though, once they get back to the hive, it's a very prominent thing. If you're looking at landing boards, you see that marking and it does look like they've been marked because it's very fine. But once they get inside, the other bees help them clean that off. And before you know it, they've harvested the pollen off of that. But it comes from jewelweed, spotted jewelweed in particular. And uh, this question comes up all the time. And I actually should have more pictures of the actual bees doing that, but it's nothing to worry about. They clean it up, they use it, good nectar source. And by the way, jewelweed is really good stuff all the way around. It grows on the southern side of my woods where we have spring water coming up. So we have a lot of damp soil and uh, it's a shade plant. So it's very interesting. It's everywhere. It's cool. And it's also in my state. So that's what that is. It's a fun question. Comes up all the time. Question number three comes from Lance from Santa Clara, Utah. I live in hot, dry southern Utah, only 90 minutes north of Las Vegas. It's hot, and I only overwinter my bees locally, then I move them in the summer. Anyway, I just got my Laura Bees Oxalic Acid Vaporizer, and I'm very anxious to try it out soon. My question is... Uh, the, OA, the oxalic acid treatments in colder months, it generally gets well into the 50s here most days, which means that most days my bees are flying. I generally do OA treatments in the early morning, but early morning temps are close to freezing here, which means the bees would be tightly clustered and vaporization may not effectively penetrate and the bees uh, to move about the hive. Then I'm not treating all the bees Later on, so when the cluster loosens and he's worried that when the bees are out flying and foraging, he's missing a bunch of bees on his treatments. So I have stuff to say about this. So Laura Bees, by the way, he has his own design, oxalic acid vaporizer. And just so you know, uh, Laura Bees, L-O-R-O-B-B-E-E-S.com. Uh, they're also the only source for the instant vape which is the new battery powered, pretty expensive unit, but super handy. So he sells both of those, his own design and that. So I thought I would plug that. I get no, I get nothing for that. There's no feedback, no kickback, no benefits other than, hey, good job. So here's the thing. Um, this is a question that comes up a lot, you know, when to treat. And yes, when the bees are clustered tight, your opportunity to get your oxalic acid sublimated oxalic onto the surface where you need it the most, which is the root areas, the nurse bees. That's where your um, mites are concentrated and they're terrible. The varroa destructor mite clamoring all over your bees. And it only works, oxalic acid, on phoretic mites, mites that are not under capped pupa cells. So just as described here, this time of year, that's why we're looking for an opportunity now even for my beehives, because today, as we know, it's too cold, they're clustered tight, they form a mantle of bees, and in the middle of all that is whatever brood is left, you've got your nurse bees, and you've also got your fat-bodied winter bees in there, which are like super nurse bees with a lot of extra resources in their bodies, and they're all protected. So when we get these warm days, I like to go higher than that, 60s as a matter of fact. So if it hits 60, any time, because now I'm in the first week of December, this is the lowest brood that I will have all year long. So if we can get a day into the 50s, a treatment is better than no treatment if you're looking at your long-term schedule. Uh, ideally, we want it to hit 60, but the concern that it gets too warm and you have foragers out so you would miss them is not a concern, I'll tell you why. Uh, last year I had a lot of fun with feeding stations and I decided, hmm, looking at wall-to-wall -wall bees on frames, because what it is, I had some crystallized honey in uh, honey frames. So I can't extract it. I didn't want to just wash it out. I thought, you know, I'll just put that out and now we get to watch bees clean it up and they go after the crystallized honey on the frame and that way we're cycling it back to your beehives. So what I did was I decided, you know what? There's so many bees here, I'm gonna scoop them off and I'm gonna do mite counts on them. 
So what I did was cycles of mite counts all day long, and I used the sugar shake method, so I wasn't killing them all, but I did not get a single mite, and I didn't do three or four treatments. I did mite sugar shakes over and over and over, right into the late afternoon, and did not get a single mite. So what that tells me is my foraging bees are not carrying mites on them. Now, if it's a hive that's completely overwhelmed with varroa destructor mites, then it's potentially true that you could have some mites on the bodies of your foraging bees because if your hive is in profound decline, if they're all out of hosts, then they would be clinging to foragers. But their choice bees to be on during their development stages, their choice is drones. Once the drone has emerged and is an adult drone, they migrate to those nurse bees because they are the most nutritious source and they go by smell. It's very interesting. They're blind after all, the varroa destructor mites, and they find nurse bees and they latch onto their abdomens and uh, feed on them. So your target group is still in the hive. So I would not wait, and I also wouldn't do it early in the morning. If you have a 50 degree morning or 40 degree morning, but you know it's gonna hit 60 in the afternoon, that's your best window of opportunity because the cluster is even more spread out. Now your target zone, which is the brood area, the bees are inside and all those surfaces, that's what we want the mites to have to do. You want the mites to have to walk on surfaces that have oxalic acid on them. And so if you've ever seen the inside of your hive after you've done an oxalic acid treatment, it settles and puts a fine dust all over the surfaces and hopefully your brood area is in that, in that uh, surface included area. So then when the bees themselves are walking on it, mites are walking on bees, mites that are on the bees are getting exposed to oxalic acid and we want the mite feet. We want their little toes which have these little translucent pads on them, which means that they can be damaged. And that's because, you know, what's interesting. Even now, they don't completely understand why oxalic acid, which is naturally occurring in the environment, why does it work on varroa destructor mites? And they think it damages their feet and that the mite loses its ability to climb onto bees to get traction on comb and eventually ends up on the bottom. That's why in your collection trays underneath, you often have live mites down there, but they just don't seem to be able to go up the smooth walls. So it's very interesting. And by the way, if you ever want to see, I'm just thinking of things right now while I'm telling you this, but I have ideas now of how I might be able to test that impact on mites. I could do a mite treatment without the bees even present. If I can collect a bunch of live mites, because I'm told by the experts that they can live without the benefit of a honeybee for up to four days. So what if I used the CO2 method to knock out bees and mites, get the mites off of the bees, nobody's hurt. Now I've got a little petri dish of nothing but varroa destructor mites and they can run around in there. What if we expose that then to oxalic acid vaporization? Then we can see, are they dying? Did they lose traction? What's going on with them? How's it killing them? Because if it's the oxalic acid vaporization, if it's the vapor itself, the sublimated oxalic acid, then uh, if that's what kills them, then they would die right then. In other words, if we got them right now, then we speculate we would have three or four days still of live mites in that container. But if we gas it, and if it is truly just the fact that they lose their ability to get traction, then we should see mites running around that are hungry, uh, but can't get traction and couldn't climb the walls. But if they're just killed by the oxalis, then they would just die right there and wouldn't run around for another day or two. What are your thoughts on that? I think we have a good backyard uh, experiment potential there that we could find out. It doesn't answer all the questions, but certainly if it's the damage to their feet pads, then uh, we would see that right away because they would no longer be able to climb up glass surfaces. Just like bees can climb up glass surfaces because if you look at their feet, which have these two little hooks, they've got that little pad right there. And if that pad were damaged, they wouldn't be able to go up glass the way they do. Interesting stuff.
So anyway, back to this, yes, go ahead and treat them. Forget the foragers, they're out there, they're gonna come back, and when they come back anyway, they're walking on oxalic acid as well. So your advantage is at that 60 degree mark, they have a loose cluster at 60 degrees, and depending on how your hive is configured, how it's insulated, whether it's a sunny day, because remember when your weather system reports 60 degrees, that's in the shade. So in the sunshine, you actually may have a much higher temperature and your bees may be spread all over the inside of the hive. But I would not worry when the foragers are out. In fact, I see the foragers being out as an advantage uh, because now we have even more space around your bees. And when you sublimate your oxalic, it's going to pass easier between the frames and onto those surfaces with fewer bees in the hive. So I actually see that now as an advantage. Moving on, question number four it comes from Ryan. San Antonio, Texas. So I'm wondering if you have any knowledge or thoughts about using alcohol and plastic storage bins to store drawn comb over winter. I recently used 90% isopropyl alcohol in a squirt bottle and sprayed my empty frames all over and then I put them in plastic storage bin with the lid on tight. A few of the frames already had larvae of all sizes tunneling through the comb. So when he says that, I think we're talking about wax moth larvae because it's just as larvae, but I'm guessing that tunneling through the comb with pretty thick webbing and a couple of spots. The alcohol killed a few larvae on contact immediately and after 24 hours in the bin, there were still strong fumes and I couldn't find a single larva left alive anywhere and nothing new seems to have hatched. Alcohol is cheap, easy to find, and doesn't seem to affect the comb or leave any residue as far as I know. So do you think this is a safe way to rid the frames of any wax moth life before putting them in a tightly sealed bin for winter? It sure would be convenient in places like where I live, where we don't get much below freezing weather and I don't have a lot of freezer space available. I've done a little internet searching and didn't find much information or formal information on the topic. Okay, so I'm going to explain. There are a lot of different things that people do to store their frames and prepare them for storage. And I will explain why alcohol is not my first choice. So, and this is where, you know, it's not, if it worked, it worked. So, but I will explain a little bit about the differences between alcohol. People that have watched me for a while know that I say bleach, specifically a 10% bleach solution. And so I want to go over that a little bit because that's my practice. There are things that bleach will kill, especially when it comes to spores, for example. So bacterial spores are not killed by alcohol. The higher your alcohol percentage too, by the way, the more volatile it is. So we, we count on dwell time. And that's why, and don't forget too, that I raised poultry and that a lot of this goes back to poultry science days where we spray things down with a 10% bleach solution because it soaks into dried material. And it's a dwell time that really does the work. And because I prefer bleach because there are no harmful residues left behind, it also has the ability to take out bacterial spores, so it kills more than the alcohol would. And the other thing is, um, I use that even on stored frames, boxes, anything you want, you can spray it with a 10% bleach solution. And over time, it also just dissipates on its own. And you smell that kind of bleach residue smell, it's not as strong as the alcohol, but it would also do what you described here as far as killing any active larvae. If you're gonna close it up in a tote, and you spray that with 10% bleach. Or you can use, for those of you who are wondering, well, it's one tenth. You could also use one third a cup of bleach to one gallon of water, or four teaspoons of bleach to one quart. By the way, there's a lot of discussion among scientists and experts and people that use the stuff. Uh, some say it has to be less than 24 hours old. So for example, don't pre-mix it. Others say they did testing after it was five days old and they had equal effectiveness in cleansing with bleach after that time frame. But we're back here beekeepers. It would not hurt us because we're talking about expense here. You mentioned the cost. 
um, right now, and this is just off of Amazon, so I'm sure you might have a local source for the stuff, but if you're buying a gallon of um, alcohol, you're gonna pay $17.73 for a gallon. And it sounds like you're using it full strength. So here's why bleach is not only better, but it's cheaper. So I looked at Amazon too. You can get 121 ounce, which is 3.78 quarts. So they're, they're jipping us lately. That used to be gallon prices, and that turns out to be 1066 each. But remember, we're not taking it straight from that 3.7 quart container we are watering it down to a 10% solution. So it's much cheaper. We're gonna be able to use this much longer and you can use bleach on a lot of different things. Now, obviously your clothes and stuff, bee suits are white. What do you care if it bleaches your suit a little bit? Based on some of that suits I've seen out there, we could use a little bleaching. But uh, anyway, so bleach is actually cheaper, more effective. You can spray all of your frames with it, all your cells, uh, because also don't forget that um, alcohol can denature some of your lipids. So for example, it could break down some of your beeswax and stuff if you concentrate too much of it. So where the bleach water does not. So here we go, that's just, I'm gonna put a little link down there for those of you who really wanna read about how bleach functions and how alcohol functions and maybe see what some of the comparisons are between the two, but I have to say personally, I recommend bleach over alcohol. I even spray the walls of my chicken coops and stuff. Nest boxes, you know, perches, everything. When the chickens are all out running around, I spray everything down in there and I just leave it and let it dry out and it has a residual effect also. So it's very effective and uh, lots of things that you can use bleach for. So that's what I recommend. And by the way, don't get like the splashless uh, bleach and things that might have additives in them. Be careful that you're buying just bleach with no additives. That's important too. Question number five says Lil Mimi 1919. So that's the YouTube channel name. My boxes are warping. They are dovetailed commercial boxes. I probably thought Glue would be stronger and didn't use enough nails. Plan on screwing empty boxes. I have a very well and swapping the frames, but of course this needs to wait until spring. Getting some straps for the circumference of each box, top and bottom, to try to pull it tight or at least keep it from warping out further. The problem now is there are significant gaps between the boxes. I'm in Arizona, so it's not desperately cold, but it's in the 40s overnight, low 60s during the day. Getting colder, of course, we do get some winter nights in the 20s. Painter's tape will block the drafts, but do not provide any insulating factor. Do you think taping the gaps would be enough to get through winter, or should I also put something else on the gaps? Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about weaknesses in beehives, and yes, clamp and glue all your bee boxes. And there's a weak point on your bee boxes that frequently opens up. This sounds like a much bigger warping issue than I'm about to talk about. This is one of my grapes about hive designs. Now this is just a nucleus box that I had handy here, but I wanna show you this joint. See this spot right here? This little skinny piece is because there's a miter joint right there which provides the shoulder that your frames rest on. But when you look at the side of it, see how skinny that is? And this part is the most frequent part in my hives that opens up. If you did not glue that well and clamp it when you're putting them together and see the screw, the screw's down here. You want a screw to go right through this part too up here to hold that in place. So we need the combination of glue. And I like the small stainless steel self-tapping screws. And that's because it'll drill the hole, won't split the wood. And so what I first do is glue it up, clamp it up. And then once the glue is dry, after that's done, that's when I put in the self-tapping screws and uh, then you won't have that problem because warping is an issue. This is a migratory cover 
see these edges right here? That's a minor warp, not a big deal, but that's because this entire thing is just held together with screws. Uh, had I glued this piece all the way across, now this came already built, so I didn't make it. So better be, didn't do that. So anyway, um, if I were making it myself, I would glue that whole seam, clamp it, and then of course I would have screws definitely out at the ends. And see this cupping that happens, this is finished with eco wood, by the way. So I wanna mention eco wood, because I did a whole thing about that too. Eco wood will not prevent warping. You still have to glue the joints. You still have to put screws in. Eco wood prevents wood decay. So it is not stabilizing the wood the way a lot of people think it should. So because I use equal eco wood and I have promoted it in the past, I need to explain that. You, those same weak points, those thin joints and areas like that, uh, need to be glued and mechanically fastened. If, if no other part of your hive is, that needs to be stabilized. And so, and the other thing is, what is the best wood glue to use? What do you guys use? Tight Bond 3. Now, Tight Bond 2 and Tight Bond 3 are both considered all weather exterior wood glues. Tight Bond 3 is considered waterproof. Now, that doesn't mean it can go underwater, but it also gives you a longer working time, and it's a dark brown. So if you hate the dark brown look, for me, it's function over its appearance. So Type Bond 3 is what I use most often, and I take acid brushes, they're called. You can get whole bags of them, and I paint the joints um, with an acid brush and then uh, clamp it all up, and I use bar clamps. So let's say that you already have, you're looking at it right now, but you've got temps going up into the 60s, that's doable. So let's say that little, here's the end of the box, you've got that little piece that's cupped out like this. Here's what I do if I find that now. Don't mess it up, you get one shot. I take a little squirt, or you can take an acid brush or something like that, and you get your tight bond three or two in there, and that little open joint, you use those little brushes to get in there and you paint both sides of it and then you bring up a bar clamp even with your bees inside the hive and then you just start twisting your bar clamp and you draw that closed once the glue is set because you can't put a screw in it because you got a bar clamp in the way so once that glue is set give it 24 hours give it 48 hours what do you have to lose leave your bar clamp right outside come back later get a small you know inch to an inch and a quarter self-tapping stainless steel screw. Some of them are square drive. And you, then once you take your clamp off, you put that right in there, problem solved. So then you've got, you've recovered that. Now, if you've got big warping problems beyond that, you are looking for spring because now you have to do something else. But that's how I'd fix an opening like that. Now, let's say you've got an opening, you just noticed it, you're going outside and you're looking at your beehives because the weather's nice and, and you notice that your hives are a little misfit and there's now it's not alignment problems, it's somehow you left chunks of something in between where the surfaces come together and that now bees can see out. I take the stuff that people wrap trees with. So it's, it's at landscaping stores, garden centers and stuff like that. And uh, you can wrap that joint. The stuff I used last year, which was kind of a joke because uh, it just looked funny and obnoxious. It's kind of a green color and it looks like felt. And I also bought oversized stainless steel safety pins. And I wrapped it around that two or three times. I just bought it from Amazon, of course. And uh, then I just put the safety pin on and held it there in place. And it actually, that colony did really well. They made it through and then I was able to replace the woodwork uh, later, the following year. But that stopped them from being exposed to open wind, rain, weather that happens in the winter time, because I did not notice it until we were already into cold weather. And it was much better to do that than it would be to pull the entire hive apart and do modifications this time of year. So hopefully that answers some of that. And now, oh, someone else asked about uh, hive visors and actually Somebody's going on vacation and she put her hives are set up. She's got landing boards, snow coming in, no hive visors. And she was leaning tiles up on the landing board against the face of the hive, 
to provide them with some shelter. And uh, I kind of said, I don't think I would put tiles up against that. Um, just your best kind of just to leave it open. And hopefully everybody is configured for winter right now. Uh, Entrance is being cleared. I don't know how long she was going to be out, but here's an example of where our south facing hides are a huge benefit because the landing boards are facing south. You get a little sunshine. We have sunshine right now. It's going to melt away any snow and stuff that's on the landing boards. Your bees will have an opportunity to do cleansing flights and also get any dead bees out of those entrances. But when it comes to high visors, for those of you who have them, and I'm not saying everybody needs to have them, I just use them there on most of my hives, not all of them, because how can I make a comparison if they're on every single hive? But so high visors adjust, you know, because they have little thumb screws and you can put them up high in the summertime because where's the sun? Directly overhead, so it casts a shadow down the whole face of the hive and the landing board is shaded in summertime. Now we've got the sun in the southern hemisphere, it's moving to the south. And so now we can bring the high visor down lower and it keeps snow from piling up on your landing boards. Instead, the snow piles up on the hive visor and goes up against the front of your hive. So then the low sunshine still hits the landing board. So now we've got protection. Your hive visor hangs beyond the landing board. Bees move around in there. We've got rain coming too, so it's not gonna rain on the landing board, but also all of your hives should be tilted a little bit towards the landing board. We say that a lot, but it's worth mentioning again. And if you forgot to do that, or if you didn't know it, and you go out there and you're looking and snow's melting and that moisture is going into your hive instead of out, this is your opportunity to now shim the back of your hive because you're not open the hive to do it. You can certainly shim the back of your hive so that we do have a nice watershed away from your entrance when it comes to winter time. So those are my ideas on that. And today's shout out. That's right, that's the end of all the questions. Today's shout out is, uh, this is from a website because I was actually looking up information about jewel weed. And I came across a website where the guy was very thorough and talked about, you know, I don't know if he's a botanist or what's going on, but he certainly has all the details worked out. So I thought he would be worth uh, sending my viewers to. And uh, the YouTube channel name is Trillium colon wild edibles so he spells trillium t-r-i-l-l-i-u-m and that's a woodland plant that i have here too so that's really interesting and the title of the video this link will also be down in the video description below but it's how to identify jewel weed now he doesn't explain how they mark the bees but i thought for those of you who want to know more about these native species and uh, other benefits that they might have this is a really good channel, so I thought I would give him a shout out today. And that's it. So I hope everybody else is uh, comfortable with the way they've configured their bees, that you're all set up for winter. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're in summertime and things are going gangbusters, good for you. And uh, here, we're just looking for that warm up so we can get that oxalic acid vaporization treatment in there and put the last nail in the coffin of those varroa destructor mites that are trying to survive winter with our bees, which then would suddenly reproduce when the bees ramp back up. In just a couple of weeks here now, they're gonna start more brood again. This is our window of opportunity. So hopefully you're ready to go, everything is good, and that you found today's video to be helpful. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for being here.